to break the spirit of the population. Hundreds and thousands of Hindu women were forced to marry. There are Aurangzeb streets, Tipu Sultan, rapists, people who tried to commit genocide, their names should not be on our towns and streets. Thousand temples were destroyed in Kashi. For almost eighty years, all of Kashi was in ruins. A blind man can see what is Gyan Vapi. By Braille, you can see these are Hindu icons. That's why I said Hindus are Mukha Pranis. Our voice is not loud. People say twenty thousand temples, forty thousand temples. Is it even feasible to reclaim all of this? If you hand it over, there will be Biradari going. I don't think most of the minority community has any issue except these illegitimate leaders post this election. These illegitimate leaders will be pushed aside. Bharat is waking up. Avi Mukteshwar should be a living reality by 2028. For starters, um, you know, I'd like to ask you that how do you see a book like this and why is it important in a Bharat today, a Bharat that has just witnessed a once-in-a-lifetime Pran Pratishtha of Ram Lalla at Ayodhya after 500 years of struggle and strife. And a lot of our critics, and I'm sure we have lots and lots of them, you more, me less, uh, of various shapes, sizes and colors in both India and outside. There are no critics, they are abusers. <laughs> yes, yes, I was just being kind to them. Uh, <laughs> who would probably dub, uh, you know, a venture like this as uh, a majoritarian agenda, Hindu chauvinism, revivalism. So is it that for you or uh, works like this? going to the very heart, the nub, the essence of touching what is our civilizational identity as Bharatiyas. See, a successful invader not only… not only takes the geography of land, it's very important for him that he takes the geography of the mind to take the mental scape or the mental geography, it's very important to write history in such a way that one who comes and robs and loots us will after a while look rich and even aspirational. This is the epitome of today's Bharat, that people who looted, raped and robbed us, they have become aspirational to us <laughs> That is mainly because uh, of the way our history has been written, not by us but by them. But in the last seventy or seventy-five years, we didn't care to rewrite it. We didn't care to put the picture of the oppressed. Just anywhere, if you… if you… if there are twenty, twenty-five movies from Hollywood, one will be about the Jewish holocaust, one will be about the oppression of, uh, you know, the black slaves from Africa. But there's not been one goddamn movie or even a book really of considerable currency in the society about what's happened in this country, what's happened in this land. If you really look back, the worst kind of atrocities have happened. If you take a period of hundred years, nowhere else on the planet such atrocities have happened. Such large-scale murder and rape and loot has happened as it happened here. But uh, we are… Uh, we are people with a very quiet sense of pride, so we think if we don't say it, it didn't happen to us. 
we just don't say it. That means it did not happen. See, it's like the Japanese, they won't talk about Hiroshima Nagasaki. They won't talk about Fukushima and its suffering. They just go about as if nothing happened. Because there is a quiet sense of pride, not a loud pride. Those who have a loud sense of pride will write books, make movies, make drama about it. But this is a very quiet sense of pride. We've been diligently trying to recover this. <laughs> what was taken violently, we try to take it with legal process. Not of a few years, a few centuries of legal process. Have you ever heard of a legal process going on for three hundred, four hundred years in the courts? <laughs> this is what India is. <laughs> But we still believe one day justice will come, and fortunately it has come <laughs> as, as ridiculous as it is, it's also deeply... I deeply appreciate it also. What kind of people are these? For five hundred and fifty years they've been going to courts run by various kinds of people, from Islamic courts to British courts to Indian courts, the same case about the same temple. <laughs> what kind of people will do this? They could have... there are times they could have violently taken it back, but no, they went to court. Still, we are in court. One has been successful, others looking a little, little better, but this is a... this is a civilization which is relevant, not just for the people who live here, this is a civilization which is relevant to every human being on the planet because this is the only inclusive civilization. I'm not saying all Indians are full of love, they're ready to embrace you tomorrow morning. No, individual people are who they are. But there is no... no place on the planet where there is a scriptural guidance for you to be inclusive. Everywhere, scriptural guidances are always about exclusivity. This is the only civilization where almost all our scriptures are talking about embracing the humanity. Not only humanity, embracing all life forms, there is no such place on the planet. To make it a reality in this nation and in the world, I think is the important task that we have for the generation which is here today, that an inclusive way of living that it doesn't matter who you are, how you look, what you believe, what you don't believe, what you eat, what you don't eat, is not my business. Whichever way you are, you're okay with me. I'm excited about the differences. I'm not seeing how to make you like myself. I'm seeing how to embrace you. From which angle will you fit into my life? <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, very important because the future generations, will not... Uh, <coughs> with the technologies, at least if not out of realization, at least the technologies have obliterated many boundaries. Technology has... by itself has brought some sense of yoga into people's lives. Because the word yoga means union or a conscious obliteration of individual boundaries. In many ways, technology has done this to us, a an obliteration of individual boundaries, social boundaries, national boundaries are obliterated because of technology. And this is the best time because if you look back on this civilization, this is the only civilization which approached human well-being in a scientific manner, in a logically correct manner. This is why the land is full of debate, endless debate. It's a fantastic thing that it's also worked to... against our well-being and interests because when we were being looted and raped, we still debated. <laughs> Unfortunately <laughs> But we got into the habit of debating so much that whatever happened, we debated. So sometimes it's been tragic, these debates, but it's fantastic that even the most cruel things that happen to us, we are willing to debate, not simply fight all the time. So, uh, this is where we are and at this time, 
uh, people like you who are writing history with, uh, with facts, fortunately <laughs> because uh, <coughs> the, the ladies may not like it, but it's his story, you know <laughs> uh, Because we must understand in old English, him was not just a man, he was not just a man, it was human being, was a he. So even here in India, Purusha does not mean just a man, it means the human beings. Then further division happens of three and Purusha, but generally Purusha means a human being. So similarly man meant just that, woman means a man with a womb. <laughs> so, <laughs> these are trying to even treat human species between two genders as if they are two separate species has come in the world at a time like this. The civilization that we call as Hindustan or Bharat is of vital importance to the world. So, it's very important to look both the macro aspect of Hindustan and the micro aspects of Hindustan. This is why I was a bit excited about your books because uh, it is autobiographical, at the same time it's history. Autobiography is micro, history is macro. So this combination is very needed, otherwise we don't have insight into people's lives, we just have a bunch of facts which we can't relate to. What is the use of facts? and dates without taking people's experiences of that day. So this is a civilization where people think uh, we have no sense of history because we never bother to meticulously chronicle our dates and events like that, but we only chronicle people's experiences. Because people's experiences, whether it happened a thousand years ago or five or ten thousand years ago, are still relevant. Dates and events are of no consequence actually, except unless you want to earn a PhD in history, which should be easy because you can only talk about what is already there. <laughs> if you talk about something that's not there, that's called fiction <laughs> So, uh, it's very important that some Vikram is writing history from a individual perspective through the experience of a human being. Well, some conjecture is there, but looking at the events, we know this is what could have happened. This is how Ramayana and Mahabharata were written, it's history. But because we got so influenced by foolish accumulation of facts and dates, we started saying this is a mythology, this is not history. So, we have even separated what is mythology and what is history in this country. No, there is no distinction between the two, it is historical, but human perspective, not just academic in nature. Please. How does one delineate the two, Sadhguru? Like, uh, you know, recorded scientific history and legends, so to say, because even in the research of this book, while I was tracing the hoary past of Kashi and of the Vishwanath Mandir, when you fall back on the Puranic literature, uh, every king is ruling for 32,000 years, someone else is there for lakhs of years. How does a modern 21st century historian who's grappling with this try to integrate these very different worlds? Because Bharat, I think, speaks in a very dialectic way. See, when somebody says uh, a king ruled for 100,000 years, one thing you must understand, zero was invented by Indians. <laughs> so we have a certain liberty <laughs> with that, <laughs> that we can use it. Actually, nobody added one, two, three, four, all right? We only added zeros. So you can't blame us <laughs> But you must understand it in this way. Either that historian who wrote, that he ruled for hundred thousand years, he's a sponsored historian. <laughs> or they loved the king so much, they did not know how to praise him. 
So they said he ruled forever or he ruled for hundred thousand years. So depending on the number of zeros, you must understand that's how much love and praise that they had for him <laughs> yeah, For anybody ruling any kingdom, at the most you can leave one zero intact. <laughs> Coming specifically to the Kashi Vishwanath uh, temple and the case, Sadhguru, uh, in the case of Ayodhya, I think people kept asking us, show us the evidence, where is the evidence and so on. In this case, uh, I mean, a lot of you would have visited uh, Kashi through gate 4 when you go there, the first uh, vision you have of the Gyanvapi Mosque, first of all, that is an oxymoron, <laughs> uh, a Sanskrit name, well of knowledge for, for a mosque is a little uh, odd. The western walls, the ruins are all the remains of a 16th century grand temple that was built there. Uh, and despite that, as you mentioned, we've gone through the peaceful route. Cases have been going on for 200, 250 years in this case, unlike Ayodhya. Probably we like to argue in the court. <laughs> <laughs> they are two argumentative Indians that we are. And now we have dumped them. They kept asking, where is the evidence? Now we have dumped them with 800 pages of Archaeological Survey of India's report that just came back, uh, came out last month uh, or so, which details every little bit. So how much evidence is sufficient for those opposing the temple to actually say, we will agree? Does Aurangzeb need to come out of his tomb and say, yes, I did demolish it? And that is only uh, when they will accept this. See, most of the temple demolitions that happened, uh, they always had a historian with them. Because in their mind, they wanted to be remembered as people who demolished this temple and demolished or destroyed idolatry and established whatever they think is the highest form of religion. So they wanted to be remembered as those people who destroyed these temples. So the proof today doesn't mean anything because they themselves have written very proudly that I destroyed this temple. And uh, for example, in Mathura, the man who is writing down says, this is the greatest building I've ever seen in my life. So elaborate, so magnificently done, this cannot be the work of a man's hand there is a divine hand in this, but they proceed to demolish. And uh, it's all they themselves have written, you can't say that they wrote lies. This is because people who wrote our textbooks screwed up our minds so badly that uh, we don't have a voice to say this is not right. And uh, unfortunately, our legal system, political system uh, and education systems, very key three aspects of this nation, were taken over by those people for first fifty, sixty years. And because of that, our own minds are like this somewhere. I have taken some time to turn my mind upside down, otherwise my school, college mind, though I barely went there, Still it had influence on me <laughs> because uh, somewhere there is a sense of, as I said, it's become aspirational to be like the uh, invaders. There is also a sense of shame to be the victim. So we don't want to be identified with that. If possible, we would like to change the color of our skin, not me, but a whole lot of people. There are movies like this where people are changing the color of their skin. Of course, there are uh, cosmetics to change the color of your skin because somewhere invaders have become aspirational, which is a terrible thing to happen to any people. But it's happened. Fortunately, there is a revival and suddenly there's an upsurge and there is political will and uh, Suddenly, judiciary seems to have found its feet. Uh, <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's forget all these things. If we just go by the constitution of the day, which itself has some aspects because nobody 
ever can write a perfect book about anything. You, it's okay because you're a book writer, I'm saying <laughs> Completely <laughs> agreed to that. Nobody can ever write a perfect book. This is the dilemma of any… any book that you write. If you read it over a thousand times, you will see still it's either this must go, that must come, that must go, this must come. Endlessly it will go on unless somebody else, an editor says, either you give it to me tomorrow or you're done <laughs> This is the nature of the book. So constitution also, even Ambedkar did not claim it's a perfect constitution, a very well done work, but not a perfect book. Having said that, there there are some issues, but even if you go by the present day constitution, it's very simple. A blind man can see what is Gyanvapi, bra braille, you can see these are Hindu icons. It doesn't take anyone eyes to see it, but it takes sixty, seventy years of legal process for the wise judges to see. And so, hope we don't stand for contempt of court here. <laughs> that is a scary proposition. <laughs> no, contempt of court is only if I say something about the present day judges. I'm talking about the past, <laughs> the hoary past. <laughs> So, so much delay and so much dilly-dallying has happened. I feel in many ways, any process, education, judiciary, whatever process that happens in a given land, one way or the other is influenced, if not totally controlled by the ruling class. So, when the ruling class were totally in that way, I think everybody found a gap in the constitutional process as to how to please the ruling class. So a time has come where there is upsurge of awareness in the nation and I don't think the judicial officers can escape the upsurge of awareness and they cannot rule anything in a way that is negative to the civilization and not in coherence with the constitution. We are not even asking for anything beyond the constitution. What is within the constitution must happen. Nobody can say no because this is a right. I'm saying this because somebody had the temerity to pass a law in 1991 saying that Citizens of India cannot go to court about certain aspects that matter to them. Places of worship. Nowhere in the world, nowhere in the world, no democratic nation can ever say, a citizen cannot seek legal recourse. There is no such nation. Definitely we don't want to be such a nation either. But a law like that was passed, but still we are hesitating to strike it down. And I don't know how it escaped the scrutiny of Supreme Court. How can it be? How can you say the citizens of this nation cannot seek legal recourse about things that matter to them? So why you spoke about the present, I'd like to pull your attention a bit to the past because that's where the seeds of all the troubles of the present are perhaps there, Sadhguru. And you alluded to the ruling class. So was it, uh, of course, the uh, answer is a yes, but then uh, was it the Nehruvian Marxist so-called consensus and this false uh, model of secularism, where all the time uh, it was the Hindu consciousness that had to be toned down. A Hindu could not wear her identity proudly as every other community in India could. There was always this albatross of guilt, of inferiority, and this albatross also of social harmony, communal amity was always put on the shoulders of the, the Hindu. And today there is a pushback to that saying thus far and no further. And did this in some way also influence the way our systems ran, the way all the, the judiciary or the education system, all of that. And where do you see 
this shift from the so called nehruvian secularism is it a very important juncture in our country today where there is a rupture with that consensus that we had somehow built of the idea of india say i don't want to get lost in this terminology of this is nehruvian that is indira gandhi even whatever whatever because you are very gender conscious and you're saying she he all this stuff i will say they from now on <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, why I'm saying this is, it's not that we have no regard or respect for women, absolutely. It is just that this whole thing about just changing one word and thinking we are done with it, there is so much that needs to be done. But once you change one word, it looks like it's done. It's not done, all right? In any given society, whether they don't like it or they don't like it, it's very important that to create a level playing field for both genders, this itself may be a crime that I'm saying both, that, that I'm saying there are only two. This may be a crime in today's world, but anyway, to give a level, level playing field for all human beings, of whatever kind they are, ladies, gentlemen, and those who have not made up your minds. <laughs> Whoever you are, to give a level playing field, one important thing is, this is uh, supposed to be an obscene, obscene thing to say, that is because they are not in reality, they are living in, you know, textbooks or they're living in classrooms or academics, without protecting women, without giving a certain amount of protection in the law and in the society, nowhere will there be level playing field. Well, there are a whole lot of women, they saying, oh, we don't need any protection, then you don't know the nature of the existence. Because of the biologists that we are, one needs little more protection, this doesn't mean it's less. Something needs more protection does not mean it's less than something else, it's different. So it needs little more protection and uh, if that protection is absent in a society, level playing field is just a joke, it'll never happen. In the name of equality, we will exploit women and children because physically there is a little disadvantage which will be exploited of course. So, in that context, this whole process of, I don't want to call it Nehruvian or Marxist, yes, they played the game, but I think they are also people who are overawed and made invaders aspirational, victims of the same… Uh, uh, the same process that the invaders set forth. But of course, there are moments in history, there are moments in recent history, when I say recent in the last hundred years, which the way we've been taught doesn't make any logical sense. There are question marks which have not been answered. And probably even now the nation doesn't have courage to face those questions and find answers to that, which I feel the coming generation must ask those questions, why? Why certain things were done the way they were done? Why partition? Because you can forget the pain of those millions of people. Still the two nations are continuing to bleed, all right? Over a million people dead and over six, seven million people were forcefully pushed from this side to that side and that side to this side. This is not a religious question, this is a question of humanity. Six million people leaving everything that they have, just leaving and in great hurry going and being refugees in another country, still in refugee camps, some of them after seventy-five years, and over a million people butchered. You can forget it if you want. If you put your humanity to sleep, you can forget anything. But if your humanity is alive, these questions must be asked and they must be answered for our generation and particularly for the future generations, these questions must be answered.
to i think closely allied to that sadguru was also the fact that uh, since the hindu as i mentioned had to tone down the identity their identity no tone uh, not tone down uh, slink around yeah, yeah slink around not be seen not yes, be not be seen <laughs> <laughs> was was that also the reason and since we're talking here about a sacred city like kashi you see that almost all our sacred spots particularly in northern india kashi ayodhya mathura prayag gaya they all languished in so much of squalor dirt filth uh, and it was not at all accessibility was not there only now ayodhya has an airport they have roads even from an angle of so called the spiritual tourism and the kind of economic benefits it could bring to the country Uh, it was not thought of to be important at all uh, so how do you see the manner in which we have neglected our sacred spots in the last 75 years and what has all this collectively done to the hindu consciousness the hindu psyche today so if you look at uh, any of the ancient temples most of the north indian temples are not ancient they have been been rebuilt hurriedly many times over so they're not really ancient that way but as you come further sa- down south you can see ancient temples who largely are on the same foundations on which they were built <laughs> if you look at these temples you can clearly see if somebody had to build this 1000 years ago or 2000 years ago in terms of engineering architecture and the immensity of those temples without any machines or means of trans- mechanical means of transportation to build these temples would not have been an ordinary feat it's a feat it's not construction it's a real feat you are from tanjavur area all right so the brajeshwaran temple well a 80 ton gopuram is sitting there at that some height. yes single piece at that height how did these people have the will to even plan something like that forget about executing it takes a certain daring even today with all the machines we don't dare to build anything like that this effect we... if we build it collapses very soon don't say that to me <laughs> ours won't collapse <laughs> i'm talking of secular bridges and metro rail pillars and so on <laughs> <laughs> so when they built such great temples obviously they would have created an ambiance of proper roads approaches and gardens and few hundred acres of land around it today you see it looks like these ancient temples were built in a small little gully because the approach is the, like that so everything has been taken by whom see once the ruling forces don't care what happens to it then even the people who belong to that culture and may believe in that religion and may be participating in that religion their sense of property value will overtake their faith and their devotion if i allow here maybe some of our devotees will want to set up a camp here initially a tent then a small little more something lot of people will want to set up right here in the garden because there is a certain enforcement of law you can say it won't happen but this happened over a period of time there were nobody to enforce anything so certain lawlessness essentially things which are not legal things which were not people take somebody else's property whether it belongs to a man woman child or god they will take it because this these compulsions are there in human beings so today most great temples have entrances or approach roads which look like these idiots built such a big monument with no approach who is that idiot who planned this this is what you would think but that's not how they planned that's what we have done over a period of time so this is essentially happened not just post independence even pre independence whoever was there 
in the last four hundred years, three hundred to four hundred years, they did everything possible to see that Hindu tem temples, if possible, destroy, where not possible, they languish. That unfortunately is continuing even today. But in the context of Kashi and what we are talking today, I think I'll go to a, a million dollar question that everybody in the… Why are questions rated as dollars <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a ten crore question or hundred crore… No, no, no. Crore. Why is… why is the question and the significance of the question is monetized? You should not do that <laughs> uh, A very important I, question. Yes. Uh, a very valuable question, that burning question like, you know, in Republic TV you have that fire… Fire burning. So, if it's a burning question, you can say it's a burning question. If it's a sweet question, being the season, you can say it's a mango question. <laughs> you can… If it's a furious question, you can say it's a monsoon question. Don't bring money into the question. Sure. <laughs> this is a very American thing. Yeah. Everything is dollars <laughs> So, we're talking a lot these days about reclamation of sacred spaces and we Probably the first example was of Ayodhya, Kashi has gained a lot of momentum, Mathura is probably next in line and people, a lot of critics of the reclamation movement are asking, where will this stop? Uh, where, how far will you go? There are various numbers floating uh, around. I think Dr. Sitaram Goelji had documented about 1,826 or so documented cases of encroachment like this. Some people say 20,000 temples, 40,000 temples. Is it even feasible to reclaim all of this? Uh, where do we draw a line between so-called social harmony and reclamation? And as a spiritual master of our times, who inspires millions all over the world, what would be your prescription for this very, very vexed question that we face today as a society? See, as I said, uh, this liberality with zeros, <laughs> there's a little bit of a problem on that one. but. Who am I to say that only a large temple or a, a well-known place like Kashi or Mathura should be reclaimed? Somebody else's small temple, which was their Kula Daivata or something has been taken and they want it back and they don't have to get it back. It's not for me to say that because their emotion for their little temple is as much as man may be about Kashi. So it's not for me to say whether they should get it back or not. Because we've already said this, we <laughs> and also within the framework of the constitution, what was taken from you? Since tomorrow morning, what do you drive? Uh, a Zen. Zen, okay. So, uh, <laughs> maybe you think it'll give you wisdom, it doesn't. <laughs> It hasn't so far, <laughs> I've been trying. So, suppose you are driving something really worthwhile hmm? <laughs> and I stole it from you and I parked it in my garage. Then after fifteen days you realized I have stolen it and you came and you took the car from my garage, I can put you in prison. This is a constitution, okay? Because you are driving a Zen, you are safe. <laughs> no one's going to take it from me. <laughs> Twenty years ago, somebody would have taken, <laughs> not now <laughs> So, uh, so somebody has taken the temple forcefully in a most ugly way, but you can't go and do the same thing today. You can only go through legal recourse. I think that's good for the country, that's good for us and it's good for everybody concerned. But wherever you have abundant proof that it's been forcefully taken, if the people who in some way connected to the temple want it back, they should have it back. If there is abundant proof and it can pass the legal scrutiny. But if we go like this, whatever you said, 1800 something, is it correct? Something like that. If you go like this, it will take another five centuries, by the time our arguments are over. <laughs> so, I feel it's best uh, we set up a, some kind of a commission or a tribunal which includes everybody. It need not be just people who belong to this faith or that faith, scientific minds who know how to study proof 
and documentation and make up your mind, this many should go, this many cannot go. Once for all it must be done in the next two to three years' time, otherwise this wound will be scratched again and again and again. First of all, we must understand, this is not against anybody. Reclamation of a civilizational… something of civilizational value is not against anybody. For example, see, beneath your house garden, suppose we find some Harappa or Mahanjadaro kind of thing, we will take your house. <laughs> I, I will not allow excavation beneath my house. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, we will take it. So it is not against you, I am saying. You just lost your house, that's all. But <laughs> we may give you another house elsewhere. But anything that is of civilizational reclamation everywhere in the world is not considered to be against somebody. It is just that something of significant uh, aspect of civilizational history is always taken back everywhere. For example, in United States of America, though the Native Americans have largely disappeared or made to disappear, even today their monuments are not some glorious structures like ours, but they were glorious for our, them, they just made mud mounds. The mounds, the mounds are very important, even now maintained like that, so as archaeological sites where you go to. So I, as a part of my, uh, you know, Native American journey, I went to seventeen Native American nations on my motorcycle during the COVID time. I made use of uh, the virus effectively, otherwise I would have never been able to go. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time, but uh, you know, my schedule, the day I arrive in United States till the day I leave, there will be schedule. But this uh, virus from China, gave me freedom. <laughs> it… it brought so many things into my life. It brought the Native American tour and uh, I started painting for the first time in my life and <laughs> well, a few people who have been praising the viruses positively. Yes, uh, I'm… I'm thankful to the one virus that, you know, it… <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say over six million people died unfortunately, but uh, it made me explore many things, it may be very uh, resilient in terms of my, you know, immunity because I did a few things at that time which is still carrying me on. For almost four, five, four, four years, uh, I went without a single day of a cough or a cold or a temperature because I did a few things at that time which I would have never done with the kind of uh, crazy schedules uh, I'm always put into. <laughs> so, I mean, People say you have to see a sil silver lining, it was more than a lining for me. And when I went there, what I saw was, uh, now we go into uh, a monument, a Native American monument, like a hokia or the snake mound. When you go there, you… being an Indian person, you're thinking, no, they are also called Indians, so <laughs> wherever I went, some of the chiefs say, we Indians, I say, no, 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 see, I'm the real Indian, you know. <laughs> you were a mistake <laughs> So, being an Indian person, your idea of a monument is, there'll be a huge temple or a pyramid or something massive. But it's just a small mound on the earth. This is a sacred mound going here and there, where, where is the monument, where is the monument <laughs> It's just a mound, but this is the nature of civilizational aspects because it's important to preserve human history and what human footprint for these thousands of years because we are in many ways a consequence of what's happened in these thousands of years. So you can't just obliterate that simply because your house is going to go, all right? I'm really going to be very careful <laughs> now after going home, I'll check all the <laughs> papers as to where this… <laughs> no, whatever <laughs> papers you may have, if we find a civilizational site, your house has to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the same thing for the temples. If there is a, a temple of a certain historicity, where it's not just a piece of stone, it's a place where poor people poured their life out. 
for those days, what it would take to build the temple, you must see. What is the investment? What is the effort that it took? How many years of life they labored to make that happen? Because without machines, all by hand, just by man's muscle, to do all this, uh, it will take a certain amount. So there is a human involvement which makes it a civilizational structure and to reclaim that is natural for any civilization. So at the same time, like when somebody says forty thousand, even if forty thousand things are given to you, are you capable of taking care of them? So, that's not the point. So the point is where it matters for people a lot, where it is there in people's memory and there is substantial evidence, there is scientific data to show definitely this happened, then this should all happen in one shot rather than dragging through the courts one by one so that the nation has… does not have to go through this confusion because there are illegitimate leaders. I'm using the word very consciously. Uh, you, normally they would say self-serving leaders, but they're illegitimate because their leadership is illegitimate. They're leaders for the wrong reasons. They have become re leaders for the wrong reasons from wrong source. If something is from a wrong source, then you say it's illegitimate. This… A lot of imagination as to whom you might be referring uh, don't do to, that. but I shall curb my imagination Please here. do that. <laughs> it doesn't take much imagination anyway <laughs> So, they are trying to create this fear-mongering am among communities and say, oh, you're uh, whatever, this is against your community, this is happening, that's happening. As maybe you have also recorded and many others have recorded that even in the early stages of Ayodhya, post-47 I'm talking about, the Muslim community was ready to hand it over. It didn't mean much to them because it was not a great mosque for them. But they knew it is Janmastan, it was Masjid A Janamstan, it was called. So everybody knew it is on Ram's Janmastan. They were willing to hand it over. It was certain crooked political agents. And Marxist historians. <laughs> uh, who add them to the mix. No. How do you call them historians? I call them political agents. <laughs> the same. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you call somebody a historian when they gather things from the past and try to put it together in a presentable manner. Not somebody who writes up things for their political agenda, that is not hist writing history, so you don't call them historians. These political agents force the communities to believe that that is not the way to go about it, let us fight no matter what, anyway we are with you, government is with you, so we'll do this, we'll do that. So unfortunate realities have happened in the past, but this is the nature of who we are. No matter what happened to us yesterday, you know, because our icons are like this. You worship Rama, he kills his enemy. Enemy, not just a political enemy, somebody who kidnaps your wife and tries to force her into becoming his wife. With such a man, he fights a battle, well, he wins, he, he could have lost. See, of course, today you believe he cannot lose. No, no, battle means anybody can lose, all right? Anybody can lose, he won, fortunately. But when he came back, he goes into one year of repentance for killing an enemy, all right? This is the kind of culture and civilization we've had, that means no matter what we have to do, some karma we have to do, we will do, but without any bitterness in our heart. No matter what somebody did to us, well, we keep our distance if they're not good to us, but there is no bitterness in our heart. So even now about these temples, I want to make it clear, in most people's hearts, this… Uh, this Jain father and son, fantastic people, what? Hari Shankar Jain and Vishnu Shankar Jain. Hari Shankar Jain and Vishnu Shankar Jain, look at their faces, they have no bitterness in their heart. They just want to see what is justice is done. There is no bitterness, there is no fight, 
Reclamation of civilization is not a fight. When it happens, we will celebrate. It is not victory, it is just a celebration. So, having said that, I don't think most of the minority community has any issue except these illegitimate leaders who have somehow placed themselves and their voices have become reasonably heard. They're confusing the people all the time and getting the community into trouble all the time. They've not brought any well-being. The most educa... in terms of education, in terms of economics, in terms of holding positions in the country, in everything, this community has been deprived because of these leaders. Otherwise, they would have done well like everybody else. They are not disadvantaged in any way. By law, they are not disadvantaged. Why are they not doing as well? Mainly because of these illegitimate leaders. Adding to what you said, Sadhguru, uh, does that also mean, you know, the, the fundamental theological difference itself between a temple and a mosque? Uh, a temple is a is the abode of a pran pratishthit deity who lives there, whereas mosque is a congregational space for prayer. And in Islamic nations itself, very routinely, they are translocated from one place to the other for mundane things like building a road or widening, uh, you know, a railway line and so on. So, if the right uh, people sit and negotiate, there can be saner elements who can be addressed? Yes, uh, if you... Hopefully, pa post this election, these illegitimate leaders will be pushed aside. If they are pushed aside, I'm... I'm very sure there is a lot of wisdom in the Islamic community. They are not senseless people, as they are being seen today because of these voices which are speaking louder than everybody else. I know, uh, I have lots of friends, families who are very close to me, who are very devout Muslims. Because I don't care whether somebody is Muslim, Hindu or Christian, they are devout, that matters to me. Because devotion is not about something, what you are devoted towards is one aspect. But because you have devotion in your, in your heart, you, there is a certain transformation in your life. So, the devout Muslims would have no problem because clearly the Sharia law says that you can never take another man's place of worship and build your place, it is haram. So just by that, not even by Indian courts or Indian constitution, just by Islamic law, it will not fly. But as I said, these illegitimate leaders were constantly mouthing hatred, which is not there in the hearts of common people. And I'd like to play, it's a hard role to play devil's advocate, but the devil here needs to be uh, represented. Because every time one talks about reclamation of temples, the, often the argument comes, what about, it's a mythical argument, but what about the Buddhist structures that the Hindus, you know, allegedly destroyed? So, suppose tomorrow there is a, there is a Buddhist stupa or a cave beneath a very grand temple. Uh, will the Hindu community also be willing to give that up? See, the reverse is also true. Tell me which existed before, which is the, the earliest uh, times. You're a historian, you please tell me. Sanatan Dharma. Yes. So, tell me the chances of temples being over, built over. There are temples over which stupas have been built because stupa is not a place for people to enter, it's just brick or mud, all right? It's a solid structure. The very idea of stupa, some people say, is because they covered the temples. Otherwise, why would you build a building that you can't enter? <laughs> so, that is another matter, but that if there are incidences like that, they are not too many, and there is nobody to reclaim them. So, if really, if you have solid evidence like that, maybe that will also have to come into picture, whether Hindus have built over uh, Buddhist uh, sites or Buddhists have built over Hindu sites, if they are of significance to people, if it's still in their collective memory and there is scientific proof, yes, it doesn't matter which religion, whether we have to give something or they have to take something, it's perfectly okay with me. The important thing is, 
that you take pleasure in the wounds of other people's hearts, that's not okay with me. The question that you, I think, alluded to in your earlier answer, we can reclaim them, then what happens after that? Because then if it goes to the government so, yeah. control… <laughs> no, this temples, is what I was about to we'd, say. We'd rather the, let it be the, the, real, the real reclamation that need, needs to happen is not just Kashi, Mathura, thousands if not hundred thousands of temples which are in the hands of the government, run by government clerks who are not necessarily devotees. See, without a god there can be a temple, but without a devotee there is no temple. Let's understand this. So now there are thousands of temples, probably if you add up in all the states, it's over hundred, hundred twenty thousand or hundred fifty thousand temples, which are in different states of slowly being murdered. When I say murdered, if there is a temple here and the person inside who's in charge is not a devotee of the deity, it's murder. It's happening. Once that person who stands there doesn't have… They, their hearts don't beat for that deity, there is no meaning in that temple. So we have done this, so that reclamation needs to happen. We are seeing how to do this. There are so many uh, ad hoc legislations which have happened in various states. Uh, many concerned people have gone to courts and as you know, our courts take five hundred and fifty years to <laughs> deliver a judgment. But I think we need a… we deserve a parliamentary legislation which nullifies all the state legislations which were made at various times. The important reason, the only reason why temples are ha in the hands of governments is uh, because of the wealth that they had. The British were interested in the temples because there was wealth that they could easily transport to Her Majesty's service. And at least a significant part of World War II was funded by the Indian temples, from the wealth that was stolen from Indian temples. Even you hear in Kashi, when Aurangzeb and others destroyed the temples, how many camels or elephants carried gold and diamonds that were there? Because this was the land of gold and diamonds, where gold and diamonds in many places were sold like vegetables on the street side. Nuggets of gold and diamonds were sto sold like vegetables without security. That is how much it was present. So a whole lot of it was in the temples. And even now you have seen in Tiruvannathapuram temple, the estimates are incredible. That a many few… zeros there too. Yeah, many zeros. <laughs> Not out of our liberty, but <laughs> genuine zeros. <laughs> so, uh, because of wealth, they… see the Islamic invaders, they wanted the wealth to start with, Not let's not call them invaders. The Islamic marauders who came in the beginning, they wanted just the wealth, so they attacked temples. The invaders, as I said, they wanted to occupy not just the geography, but the mental geography of the population. So, they did things in a certain way to break the spirit of the population. That even your God cannot protect himself, what can you do to belittle the people, to destroy their spirit? It was done. And uh, further, this, these are the things in a man's life. Today, I know all these gender issues, but in a man's life, in the past. If you take away his woman, his God and his land, he's broken. And all these three things they took. One reason how Islamic population swelled in this country is, they took hundreds and thousands of Hindu women as slaves and produced Muslim children out of them. So the ugliness of it cannot be documented by any historian. The ugliness of that, the pain of that and the suffering of that is not something that you can put it in numbers, but it's happened. All that we are not reclaiming, just the significant important temples which are in our eyes, please don't fight it, 
just if you hand it over, there will be biradari going. Let it happen for the well-being of the nation. In a country, Sadhguru, where temples are under government control, we have… The, in, the, in the 1995, we had this Works Act, where I think after the defense and the railways, the third largest real estate holder in this country is the Works Boards across India. 75% of New Delhi is supposed to be Works property, where even the Delhi High Court, the central vista is allegedly under Works. Uh, and Are they Mumbai, paying the rent at least? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Allegedly in Mumbai, even Mukesh Ambani's house is work property. So, uh, any po at any it's point… It's okay, he will manage it. He can manage. But, uh, I'm worried about the High Court. <laughs> <laughs> and then they are the judge, jury and prosecutioner because you have a work tribunal where you have to go to uh, and they will… that's not the civil courts where you can uh, get to. So, so many discriminatory laws in a country that claims to be secular uh, which actually means the state has no business in running, uh, uh, you know, religious institutions. Uh, do you see, irrespective of which party comes, what happens, do you see any movement forward in this or does it need to be a people's movement where we all sign up and say, thus far and no further and we will not take this lying down anymore? <clears throat> the first thing is we must make up our mind whether we want to be a secular nation or a theocratic nation. I think by consensus, we chose to be a secular nation because Bharat cannot be any other way. Because we have mothered so many movements today which we call as religions, but these are all movements. Buddhism was a movement, it is not an ism. It's like if tomorrow this, <laughs> these Isha people, you know, if they grow in numbers, the idiots may declare their religion by themselves. <laughs> I will not allow that. I have put in mechanisms so that it doesn't happen. Like this, a Buddha came, a certain number of people followed him. It's a spiritual movement. But somebody else from outside comes and labels it as ism. So people who followed Mahavir, they are very devout spiritual people, all right? Very disciplined focus people towards what? Towards liberation, which is the fundamental goal of Sanat and Dharma. Who separated these things? Because people wanted these things to be separate. People saw in this collectiveness there is no penetration. So you must understand first of all that wherever they went, the invaders, you can call them colonizers, you can call them imperialists, you can call them Islamists, whatever. Wherever they went, whichever part of geography they conquered, they always transformed the population, if you can use that word, <laughs> to their ways, without exception, nearly hundred percent. You take North America, South America, Africa, Australia, you take any place where they went clean sweep, this is the only place where still after nearly thousand years of invasions and occupations, we still largely, little diluted, distorted, but still we largely keep the Sanatan ethos with us, knowingly, unknowingly. But I feel whatever damage that was caused in seven hundred, eight hundred years of occupation, more damage has happened in the last seventy years because uh, this is like an internal scrudge where, see, if there's attacks from outside, you can withstand, your pride will come up and you'll fight and you will recreate and rebuild. But if the termites eat you up from inside, you don't know what happened. One day when we touch you, you're hollow. So this hollowness has come into this generation. There is no strength of civilization in them. Their aspiration is to go somewhere because some other civilization seems to be more successful. Though when people did not know what is industry, we had industry. When people, you know, like people, uh, some of the Dutch East India Company people are among themselves writing letters to each other, they are saying, that if you want to learn anything about business, you must go to Gujarat in India, 
these people have made a science out of trade and business. Since then, so it's Since not then, new now. Not new. <laughs> so I'm saying whether it's business or trade or mathematics or astronomy or music or spiritual process or philosophy or simply thought process. The profoundness of this culture was such, invaders who came, initially they slaughtered and destroyed things, but later on they were overwhelmed by the profoundness of what was happening here. So even their sword stopped halfway. It did not go all the way because that is the reason why still eighty percent of the population is Hindu in this country because even the cannons and swords of invaders stopped looking at the profoundness of understanding of thought, music, astronomy and various sciences including in business and industry and as everyone knows today, this was not known when we were growing up. We never knew that two hundred and twenty-five years ago, we were the largest economy on the planet. When we were sixteen, seventeen, we were all wanting to go to America. Yes, genuinely. And uh, nobody told us, just two hundred years ago, we were the largest economy, biggest industrial nation on the planet. Thirty-three percent of the world's exports were from India. Nobody told us anything like this because nowhere in our goddamn textbooks these things were written. Do you foresee, Sadhguru, a Hindu reawakening happening? Or is the Hindu society in such stupor, it's almost in coma, that you're so oblivious, ignorance is bliss and not at all being aware to all the dangers <coughs> that geopolitically, strategically, religiously, in other ways surround us. We're just in our own high philosophy, not being awake to the realities that world presents to all of us. Is that resurgence possible? I don't think uh, a real resurgence is happening yet, but uh, Bharat is waking up. Still goo in our eyes, <laughs> we are awake, but still goo in our eyes, we are still rubbing our eyes, we can't believe. Yes, people of my generation still can't believe that actually this is all true. Even for me, it took some time to understand this is true because I was more left than anybody. You know, <laughs> when I was eleven, twelve, I read Das Kapital and the Engels and by the time I was twelve, thirteen, I wanted to join the armed struggle in Andhra Pradesh and <laughs> in the... the Somalu and Charu Majumdar time. So, well, I was more left than anybody because it looked like that was the only solution. As they say, up to the age of twenty-five, if you have not turned Marxist, something's wrong with your heart. After that, if you continue to remain Marxist, something's wrong with your head. That's true. I… I turned away from that well before twenty-five, okay <laughs> Because… Intellectually, Marxism looks like the most compassionate way to exist. In a way, uh, well, this uh, Isha Yoga Center is communist, not by ideology, but by life. Here, nobody knows who produces how much money for the center, but everybody gets the reasonably the same thing. Because this is communism, people live as a community. Without wondering who is what, who is… Wh what is this person's religion, what is that person's caste, we don't even know, we don't even ask. Because it doesn't matter. So, Marxism spoke about this, but in a way that is not practical. But for you to realize it's not practical, you need to at least turn eighteen. <laughs> Before that, if you get fired with Marxism, I almost went. Because I saw some corruption which disturbed me, I stepped back. Some of my friends went. One of them became a reasonably prominent leader. He got shot uh, about eight years ago in Mysore, near Mysore. And uh, the other one, I don't know where he went, whether he lay still alive or dead, I don't know. I stepped back because the man who was encouraging us to join, and we were all going. 
His own son also was my classmate. He was also with us, about five of us, he was daily, you know, ramping us up that it's time to go for you, you're fifteen, you must go. This is the time to go and fight. Just the attraction of carrying a weapon and being a part of the revolution, you know, is a, like a very big thing when you are… Uh, when you have fresh testosterone in you. Uh, a gun and a revolution and changing the whole country <laughs> like that is very, very attractive, I'm saying. So, when just the next day or the next day we are supposed to leave, we already gathered everything, I got some army haversacks with me, clothes, extra shoes, this, that works for a armed conflict, okay, going for the training. And then, uh, then I see this professor's son, uh, Mysore University was full of these people at that time. And this professor's son, he's not getting right. I said, hey, what happened to you? you? You don't have nothing? He said, no, I'm not coming. I said, why? My father said, I should not go. <laughs> I said, your father wants me to go. <laughs> he doesn't want you to go. <laughs> then I stepped back. I tried to stop the others. What's happening here? But those guys anyway went. Unfortunately, one of them died recently. Uh, other, I don't know what happened. Maybe he left or maybe he's still there or maybe he died. I do not know. I don't think anybody would survive this long in that… that kind of life. But maybe he did not become prominent, so you could have just slipped out, whichever way. So I'm… in my head, I was far more left than most people are in their life. For me, Marxism was just not a mm, romanticism of teenager. For me, it was the thing to do. It was the thing to do. So, from there I am here, who I am today, out of realization, not out of conversion. I did not con get converted. As I paid more and more attention to everything, what is sensible, what works for every human being, that is the only thing we should do. And communism as an ideology is the most compassionate and fantastic ideology. But th Marx knew so much about economy, nothing about human nature. <laughs> he knows a lot of econo economic numbers and how we can distribute wealth, do this, do that. But he knows nothing about human nature. He always thought America will be the first nation to become communist. Can you beat that? <laughs> In America, the worst, worst insult you can put on somebody is you're a communist means you're finished <laughs> That's how it is. It's happened to us also now <laughs> So, uh, he completely underestimated the human nature and thinks just the facts of economics will work, which is very wrong, which is very superficial way of looking at human activity, human mind, human thought, human emotion, human consciousness. This is a very superficial way of looking at it. Wherever it got installed, massive human disasters happen, the kind of disaster that you can't imagine. To make Russia or that USSR what it was, to become… make it an industrial power, to make it a military power. They had to kill twenty, thirty million people of their own nation, all right? Joseph Stalin went about killing nearly twenty-six million people, that's what they say. If not twenty-six, whatever, even if it's six million people, it's too much. Of your own people, not in a war, to administer them, you start killing them. See, if these two groups fight a war, then some will die. That is the nature of war. But in administration, if I have to kill twenty… twenty-six million people, obviously I'm a lousy administrator. I know nothing about the people. I know nothing about the needs of the people. I know nothing about the aspirations of the people. I know nothing about how to do anything. Only then I'll have to kill twenty-six million people to administer my own people. Is that Hindu awakening you seeing happening in the near future? How long do you think that will take? I have no problem with the word Hindu, but because in the world's perception, 
there is a certain issue because people... It's like if you say yoga, people think you're tying up in knots. Whatever you try to tell them, it's union, it is this, it is that. Yoga, okay. <laughs> you have to look like a leftover noodle. <laughs> so, similarly, Hindu means Hinduism. Oh, you worship cow, snake. Worldwide it is spread because that's the kind of books that were written, everything done. So, uh, instead of using the word Hindu, I would use the word Sanatan is better because Sanatan means eternal. Nothing can be eternal unless it's all-inclusive. <laughs> Nothing in the universe can ever be considered eternal or near eternal, let's say, without it being all-inclusive. Unless it's breed, it breeds the creation, it cannot be eternal. A philosophy cannot be eternal, a belief system cannot be eternal, an ideology cannot be eternal. Only that which is in tune with creation can be eternal, as eternal as creation is at least. So, when we say Sanatan, we are talking about an eternal dharma does not mean a religion. Unfortunately, this word has gotten around like this, dharma does not mean religion, dharma means the law an eternal law. How you arrive at eternal laws? By observation, not by imagination, not by dogma, but by observation and realization, you come to in alignment with creation. Only that can be sanatan. So, that is the essence of who we are. That's not been conveyed to most of the Hindu population, unfortunately. They think lot of Hindus talking about, we have our own book. We did not fall out of a book, you know. We made many books, thousands of them. Well, when... Uh, when uh, Kilji guy, what's his name? Bhaktiar Kilji. Bhaktiar Kilji came, in one university, the Nalanda University, he burnt... It's, it's estimated that he burnt nine million books, five hundred, six hundred years ago, nine million books. Nowhere on the planet there were nine million books anywhere. And they, he burnt for six months. That's what they say. Some people say it's twelve months, you're saying six months, it doesn't matter. There was no petroleum, so it is possible it took six months or twelve months. More than that, they burnt over, they say, eight to ten thousand monks because most of them could recite one one book by themselves. So they thought books will live within you, so they burnt them also alive. So the incredible thing is, the modern day Bharat names that region as Bhaktiarpur. So this is one thing we must do. Vikram, you must write a book on this. <laughs> There are Aurangzeb streets, Aurangabads, there are over sixty Aurangabads. There is Bhaktiarpur, there are Kutub Minar, the man who desecrated uh, both Hindu and Jain temples and built a monument out of that. There is of course uh, Sutipu Sultan. Most terrible things were done, over four hundred thousand Hindus were converted to Islam by force by Tipu Sultan just in the Malabar region. Men were slaughtered, they say, in, in a chronicle written by, approved by his own son, that means it's genuine. They proudly claim he killed a minimum of ten thousand Hindus. And uh, men were killed, women were forced to marry uh, on the same day of their husband's death. If they did not agree, hot iron was put into their privates. This is the way things were done. And I have nothing against Islamic rulers because that's our history. We allowed them to come and it happened. Kings who ruled benevol benevolently, you want to put their name, is fine. But murderers, rapists, people who tried to com commit genocide and des desecrated hundreds of temples, their names should not be on our towns and streets. So recently somebody invited me to their house because of some pilots were meeting, you know. They said, Sadhguru, you must come, you are a licensed pilot, you must be there, they will love it, just ten minutes you come and go. I said, okay, give me the address, I will come. 
Then uh, they gave me the address and it said Tugluk Road. I said, I'm not coming. <laughs> See, you must understand, not because he's Islamic king, because of what he's done, even if a Hindu king or a Christian like Robert Clive Street means I won't go. I said, you take a spray paint and paint that street board black, then I will come, otherwise I'm not coming to your house. Shamelessly, you're living on that street. I will not walk into that street. Because why don't we have... Why don't we have Adolf Hitler uh, Nagar? <laughs> why don't we do this? Why don't we have Idi I mean, Idi I mean Nagar or uh, Puram? Why don't we? We don't do that. People who sh displayed extraordinary sense of cruelty, to other human beings, whoever they were, we don't elogize them. But today in this country, there are hundreds of towns, villages and cities and streets named after these people. I'm sure you can recount better. I am not good at numbers, names and dates. Sadhguru, in our uh, state, Karnataka, there's also Tipu Jayanti. Forget towns, it's, we are also they, celebrating his birth. Tipu Jayanti, there was a Tipu Express. <laughs> One of the worst tyrants. Even converted dead Kurgis, not only those living, yes. but even the corpses the were Kur converted. The Kurgs have uh, taken, you know, uh, we think Kurgs took the worst of the brunt. That's not a fact. It felt that way because the Kurgs fought. In other places, there were no fighting men. They just took it without so much resistance. So it's not so well recorded. Kurgs really fought. But seventy thousand Kurgis were killed. Guru. If you fight a battle and you get killed, considering those times, it was the order of the day. It's all right. It's all right if somebody comes and slaughters you in a battle. But it's not all right when you line up civilians and slaughter them and rape the women and slaughter the men, rape the women, slaughter the men. What is that? People who did that, their names should not be flying on towns and streets and circles. Uh, you know, in our country, but unfortunately it is. I hope the future uh, elected leaders of this nation have enough wisdom to change that. But what is this, you know, perverse mindset that actually hyphenates today's communities to these people? What makes those illegitimate leaders think that, you know, uh, today's community is actually will be appeased by whitewashing the crimes of these genociders and why do today's communities valorize them? No, I don't think today's communities valorize them. As I said, illegitimate leaders are there. In every way they are ill-gotten. So, these people are doing this because they've kept the community as a rule uneducated, uninformed because that is their only capital. If they come out, educate themselves in normal ways and get to economic well-being, they will not listen to these leaders. So they know that very well. They know social engineering very well, because they have done this for hundreds of years. They have been doing this successfully till now. We need to change that if we are interested in the well-being of that community and the nation. High time they did inner engineering instead of social engineering. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll get me into trouble. My final question, Sadhguru, uh, it's... Uh, uh, the title of this book is Waiting for Shiva. The, the picture is of that Nandi which is sitting on the other side and facing the mosque. Uh, and we are right behind the Nandi I, statue here as well. I saw that and I don't like it. <laughs> because Nandi is a symbol of eternal waiting. So that was my question, uh, which I've quoted you in the epilogue where you <laughs> talked about the esoteric importance of waiting and how that is such a important But in this case, we shouldn't be waiting for too long <laughs> <laughs> So the wait for Shiva, the wait for Gyanvapi, how do you see this case moving forward? Do you see this closing very soon and Vishweshwar comes back as in the Puranic texts, back to <clears throat> coming to a grand celebration, as you mentioned, not a victory over somebody, but a celebration. Avi Mukteshwar should be a living reality by 2028.
it is done it is done and by then if by your grace if there are numerous editions to this book i'll have to change the title that we change waited the for shiva. change the cover page the cover page also <laughs> to avi bhukteshwar and that we waited for shiva at some point of time thank you so much sadguru for your uh, this is fine conversation but uh, give them some history gyan huh, with all the dates and stuff i mean uh, the book catalogs the entire history of the kashi vishwanath mandir the hori past as mentioned in the puranic literature and so on but then right from 1194 uh, when qutubuddin aibak first attacked varanasi and destroyed all the temples hasan nizami one of the chroniclers says thousand temples were destroyed in kashi in just that one attack and as a guru mentioned the amount of wealth was taken over on 18 camels and 300 elephants and all the temples destroyed and within a few years razia sultan who was there just for four years she still found time to build a mosque there which is called the razia masjid which still exists there uh, and some say that is the site of the original vishveshwar temple and that's why just next to that there is an adi vishveshwar temple as well numerous iconoclastic waves happened of the jonpur sharki nawabs uh, the khiljis Sikandar Lodi who demolished the whole of Kashi towards the end of the 16th century. We have something very prominent in his name in Delhi. Yes, the Lodi estate, the Lodi road and all of that. Lodi garden. Lodi gardens and everything. Unfortunate. Uh and for almost 80 years all of Kashi was in ruins and that was when now on the one hand there is this depressing tale of destruction and i wouldn't want to limit the discourse to that because as the dis, uh, destructions were happening the other story which is of importance is of resurgence is of resilience is of courage that we showed our ancestors showed now ba- barely you know 10 15 years after qutubuddin naibak's destruction in 1212 you had a bengal ruler vishwarupa of the sena dynasty coming to varanasi and right in the heart of the city he erects a pillar a vijay stham saying this city belongs to vishweshwar it was literally marking the you know mark there and today all these i il- il- I, i appreciate his intent but a pillar will not replace a Yes. temple no at that time <laughs> it was the height of the delhi sultanat sadguru so he could not obviously build a grand temple but at least there was that sense of reclamation and more important and there to the gujaratis no i am saying this in today's times we should not go and put one stone <laughs> and said this is avi mukteshwar we want the whole thing <laughs> but then to the gujaratis were so uh, as you mentioned the most uh, industrious like we have some people in the echelons of par too uh, so you had uh, a gujarati businessman called seth vastupal who in 1240 1250 gave 1 lakh rupees in those days to rebuild this grand temple and today we talk so much all these illegitimate leaders whom you have sparred with also who talk of a north south divide south india is different north india is different for kashi and its consciousness to be regained the whole of india's heart bharat's heart bled from karnataka you had a hoysala ruler called veera narasimha who donated an entire village called hebbale so that the proceeds of the revenue that came from that village could be paid by the pilgrims who had to pay jazia tax for you to go to your own temple or your sacred spot you had to pay a tax to the delhi sultanate uh, and he says in a inscription that all this money, even now we have to pay tax yes i was just <laughs> thinking that as i we <laughs> <laughs> i come from a state which pays that tax to any temple which has revenue more than a crore so uh, there was the hoysala ruler so north south east west nobody thought this is our this is uttar pradesh this has nothing to do with my uh, culture my language they were these common you know aspects of civilizational importance and that is what defines a nation for all people who tell we were not even a nation it was a british who gave us a sense of nationhood what is a nation uh, this common sense of uh, shared emotional attachment to important symbols and markers of our civilization that is what marked this nation and in that we find an astonishing convergence over the centuries there were maharashtrian brahmins who went all the way to kashi caused a resurgence and that's how one of them narayan bhat got the temple reconstructed in 1580 when akbar was the king slightly more tolerant than the rest of them i think his work was uh... one of the most important yes. landmarks yes sir guru the 
Narayan Bhatt wrote Tristhali Setu, in which uh, he de- in detail explained the importance of Kashi mm-hmm. and its Mahatmyam. And this temple became so grand, that was the grand Ashtamandap temple to Vishveshwar, uh, which even the on news channels, you see the map that James Princep uh, in the 18th century uh, developed. This was the temple that he had established in 1580. And that lasted barely for 60, 70 years. And 1669 was when uh, Aurangzeb got that destroyed. But even after that, there were continuous attempts to reclaim, especially by the Marathas who had started gaining so much of uh, political power by then. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was alive when Vishwanath Mandir was destroyed. And it is said that his mother, Mata Jijabai, had told him that if you are man enough, the goal of your life should be the reclamation of the Kashi Vishwanath temple. And that and that was an unending stream of thought in the Maratha Samrajya. So right in the book, I also mention about the letters of Baji Rao Peshwa, of Nana Sahib Peshwa, several others negotiating with the Mughals, then the Awadh Nawabs, and then the British East India Company too, saying, give us back our sacred spots. So those of us who think <coughs> This case is only something that started now. It has political roots. No, for thousand years, our ancestors did not give up on this. Shrines fell, shrines rose. But the Hindus of Bharat never gave up, or the Sanatanis of Bharat never gave up on several of these sacred spots, particularly Kashi Vishwanath. And no wonder then, in 1778 or so, it was a Maratha queen, uh, Devi Ahilya Bai Holkar, who got another little innocuous looking mandir constructed and that is the temple that we go to and worship today. And the other interesting part is in 1836, you had Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the Sikh Maharaja who gold plated the shikharas of that which you see today. Today, people are trying to create divisions between the Hindus and Sikhs saying these are different communities as a separate Khalistan movement. But the greatest ruler of Punjab uh, revered Vishwanath, went there and prayed. It is said that when he uh, defeated uh, the Afghan ruler Durrani, he also asked for the doorway of the Somnath Mandir that Mahmud Ghazni had destroyed 800 years ago. Just imagine a 20-something young man who was probably not very educated, but that intergenerational memory that was there with him... And that it this was, was also the Nihangs who Nihang came and established uh, in Ayodhya, Ayodhya also. Yes. Ram Lala was established when he was completely out. True. They were the ones who came and wrote Ram Ram on all the walls and created this. Because of them, the cases went to the Avadh court. So the, the Sikh Hindu uh, you know, unity, which again, like the Hindu Buddhist schisms that are sought to be created, the same thing is done with the uh, Hindus and the Sikhs. So, uh, so this temple slowly started coming, but it was never given up. There were bloody riots in Varanasi. Uh, in 1810, there was something called the Lat Bhairo riots, where people uh, literally mm. wanted to reclaim the entire space. The Gyanwapi Masjid was set on fire and evacuated uh, the Muslim community from there. But the British did not want to get into these uh, difficult terrains, so they let them continue. But since then, court cases... On silliest of things, this people tree is mine. No, the branches are coming to our territory. The leaves are falling here. For all this, I think the British must have been tearing their hair saying, what is it that these two communities are constantly fighting for? But the the subtext is that it was something so important in our consciousness and that we have forgotten today. So for everyone who asks, what is the need for this? We have so many more temples everywhere. No, in the Hindu uh, idea or Hindu imagination, Sanatani imagination, once a temple, always a temple. I think the Pran Pratishthit deity that is there is a living form there, a living being whom we offer Nitya Puja as we would do to a human being. Unless you do a Vidhivat Visarjan, that energy is not gone from that space. So we need to reclaim that. It is an important enough uh, you know, um, civilizational project. And as Sadhguru mentioned, it is not against anybody. I think it should be as much a revered spot for the Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, Parsis, everyone of India, as it is for the Hindus of India. So this case too, and since independence, there have been numerous cases going on. In 1991, uh, this case was filed in the name of Adi Vishweshwar. So deity is a living entity. So he files a case uh, as the plaintiff saying, this is my house. I want the entire thing for me and my devotees. 
Now that case unfortunately got stuck in Indian courts for 22 years and it's only now in December 2023 that the Allahabad High Court fast-tracked it saying by June it should be disposed of this year. But alongside you had the Jain uh, duo whom Sadhguru mentioned, Hari Shankar Jainji and Vishnu Shankar Jain who facing innumerable intimidations, threats and all kinds of odds which I document you, you, you really you, you feel so uh, you know miserable. There were uh, attempts made to kill them. There were allurements, lots of things that they faced. No support of any government, any organization, single-handedly. And for all practical purposes, they are a minority community too, the Jains. So they fighting for one of uh, you know Hindu uh, temples uh, is really a testament. And Hari Shankarji very uh, jokingly said the 2021 case was actually filed in the name of Ma Shringar Gauri. So, and that gathered momentum very fast. <laughs> and he said, you know, Vishveshwar is a yogi, Adi yogi, uh, Samadhi, he's always sitting in Samadhi. He doesn't care whether he's found in the Vazukhana, he's found in, whether there's a temple or not. But Ma is not like that. She would not let her husband uh, <laughs> sit, sit insulted. When her own father tried to insult the husband, she jumped into the sacrificial fire and created the ruckus that all of you know, which followed after that. So here also, it was only after the case was filed by uh, these people in the name of Ma Shringar Gauri, quickly the thing started moving. There was an advocate commissioner survey that happened and then the ASI uh, survey. So in the book, there's the entire legal history. It makes for fascinating reading where at every case, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, things said to derail it, saying, no, 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 this was not a temple. This was actually Akbar's uh, Dinne Ilahi, uh, you know, structure. No, this was Dara Shiko's uh, Sanskrit school. Everything except Vishwanath Mandir everything but a Hindu temple. But, bar, you know, over from, now on, all that, from now on, I will also start saying her story, then his story. <laughs> that would be a huge <laughs> influence on the other side. <laughs> and as you all know, in 2022... Because I believe in doing what works. <laughs> it's always safe. <laughs> it's not safe, it must work, otherwise what's the use of action? That is why uh, Sadhguru very... Uh, when now, I what is the use... Time, what is the use of any action that we do if it doesn't work? Yeah. Now, that is why after meeting you last time, the first course I did, of course, after Inner Engineering was Linga Bhairavi Sadhana. <laughs> I thought that is, <laughs> that is more important. <laughs> then we will go to <laughs> Dana Linga later. <laughs> so, as part of this... Survey, as you know, uh, they, they say, you know, in the book I detail how these people in a, both parties go to that Yan Bapi site and there is this Vazu Khana, the place where, Vazu is a place where people go and do ablutions, wash your dirty feet and rinse your mouth before prayers and the Jains, uh, they wanted that place surveyed too. Now, a lot of, uh, you know, protests against that by the Masjid committee saying, no, 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 you can't go there. They knew there was something wrong there. And they tried to put all kinds of uh, obstructions, saying, no, no, there are fish in that pond, <coughs> and if you remove the water, the fish will die. Now, unfortunately for them, the Jains were more vegetarian than all of them, and they said, we have a lot of concern for these uh, unfortunate fish. So, with some oxygen cylinder brought there and all that, the fish survived, and as that water kept coming, the levels kept coming down, you had that shriveling structure that came out. And like I began, I believe everybody... Hara Hara Mahadev is how they all greeted it. Now that too was disparaged, saying, you know, this is a fountain. Uh, there was a drill on the top that was put. Uh, there's no suction mechanism. There is no fountain mechanism there. Uh, so I think that what Sadhguru mentioned, this whole reconciliation, uh, it needs to happen. It's a two-way street. Every relationship, every friendship, everything is a two-way street. Both communities need to come now, if more we, than halfway. If we say reconciliation, it looks like, like there was a fight and then we're reconciling now. As I said earlier, you can check it out if you want. Most of the Muslim community doesn't care about these things because their own Sharia law says, you can't do this. It is a handful of leaders who are, have a... Of course, there are a few hot-blooded people around them. If this is uh, in some way properly conveyed to the entire nation, 
I think it's not reconciliation, it's only reclamation of civilizational aspects. So even if Mughals are also part of history, if there are some aspects which are important of history created by them and it's occupied by somebody who may be a Hindu by his faith, it must be taken back, I'm saying. The question is not of religion, the question is of civilization. And the devotees are not... See, the devout are not really religious, it's just that their heart is brimming with humanity. This can easily be when somebody's heart is on fire, you can very easily make them violent. It's unfortunate truth because only their heart is brimming, their head is not all that realized in that sense. So somebody else, a vested interest can turn them into a violent group of people. But to get a human being to have his heart brimming is a great achievement that itself. Even that is happening, it doesn't matter through the agency of which religion, it doesn't matter. When somebody's heart is brimming, those people will have no conflict. It is just those people whose hearts are rotten and their head is full of this kind of self-significance kind of process, they're doing those things. And well, by nature, certain religions may be, uh, you know, the dogma of the religion may be saying certain things which are completely not right in the sense... See, when people broke these temples or dominated these or put taxes or took the wealth away as the British did, Either they considered you as slaves or as kafirs. You are an infidel or you are a slave. Both don't deserve much. If you consider somebody a slave, you don't believe they deserve much. If they're infidel, then also you don't think they deserve much. That attitude has to be taken out of certain dogma, which may be there, which is there rather. But still, I don't think that is in the hearts of most of the uh, people who follow Islam as a religion, it is not. Because across the Arabic world, when I travel, there is no such thing, it's just a handful of people. But those handful of people have a very loud voice. That's why I said Hindus are mukapranis. Though we are eighty percent, our voice is not loud. So, as when you asked, is there a resurgence? No resurgence yet, but they're waking up but still goo in their eyes, they need to clean that. And then they have to clear their throat. <coughs> you know, morning is an Indian ritual. <coughs> <laughs> then their voice should become clear enough so that the universality of Sanatan reverberates across the globe. This is not mine versus yours, this is about humanity. Wonderful. On that wonderful note, again, immensely grateful Sadhguru for your valuable you. time and these wonderful All the best for you in this. Hope uh, many people get to read this. Thank you so much Sadhguru <laughs> and if I have the audacity to, con uh, to conclude with a, with a suggestion that someone like you with the kind of healing touch and the kind of influence that you wield on human minds irrespective of the faith, uh, I think as the new, you know, political system comes into place, maybe from June 2024, um, I would urge you to, to take the lead in ensuring that a lot of this mediation, a lot of these SENA voices, out of court settlements, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that you spoke of, because even in divorce cases, no, people first... would want the husband and wife to settle it out of court. Yeah. In court, a lot of muck will come out. But this is not divorce, this is marriage. This is marriage. So, but... Uh, <laughs> let it not get stuck in courts. Let, let us not call Shringar Gauri Ma again and again and ensure that we no, put the, but, uh, the bonus on her. <laughs> but the important thing is, uh, the new occupiers of the temple are the government itself. <laughs> That's another so, battle to fight. <laughs> <laughs> so if they are not willing to do that, definitely their hearts are not in this either. So we need to make them see that if we have decided to be a secular nation, which is our wish, that we want to be a secular nation, then government should have no business in anybody's places of worship, anybody's. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. All the best for you. <laughs> Thank you.